let's say you are at 10 million in revenue this year. Why should you go to the grow to 30 million to to prove what to whom, right? Generally to investors, but we don't have any investors. So this freedom of doing things with common sense, being grounded, doing things the right way, doing things slowly and sensibly, in no rush to become number one or big or large has really shaped how we've built Zerola and how we've grown. So this burn money, you know, fail fast, it, it, we just don't get it. We don't agree, we don't get it. And we've never followed that philosophy. Welcome to the Software Misadventures podcast. We are your hosts, Ronak and Guan. As engineers, we are interested in not just the technologies, but the people and the stories behind them. So on this show, we try to scratch our own edge by sitting down with engineers, founders, and investors to chat about their path, lessons they have learned, and of course, the misadventures along the way. Hey everyone, this is Ronak here. Our guest in this episode is Kailash Nath. Kailash is the CTO at Zerodha, where he started the tech team back in 2013. Zerodha is the largest stock broker in India, processing 15-20% to 20% of all trades. At peak, this is 15 million plus transactions daily, supporting about 9 million users. When it comes to total volume of transactions, Zerodha is, if not the largest, then one of the largest stock brokers in the world. Zerodha is completely self-bootstrapped, has raised zero external capital, and has been profitable for years. What's further impressive is that their tech team is only 33 engineers. I first learned about Zerodha's unconventional tech team in a blog Kalash published back in 2020, and I have been wanting to talk to him since. In this episode, we talk to him about absurdism, a philosophy that guides his personal and professional worldview. We discuss how he built Zerodha's tech team, their team culture, and how the team operates so efficiently while being so lean. We discuss why Zerodha self-hosts all of their tech stack and what they look for when hiring engineers. We spent the first part of the conversation discussing Kalash's early days and the events that greatly influenced his life. If you are more interested in recent topics about Zerotha, feel free to jump ahead past the 22 minutes mark. We had a great time talking to Kalash. Please enjoy this fun conversation with Kalash Nath. Kalash, super excited to have you with us today. Welcome to the show. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Of course, pleasure. Uh, so we thought we would ask, uh, start with asking you about a number that has shown up on a few blogs that you've written. And this number keeps repeating itself. It's 97.42%. Uh, can you tell us where this number comes from? Oh, it's just a made up ironic funny number, which is meant to indicate a high degree of probability. That's all. I could have said 99%, but everyone says 99%. So you know, I made it specifically 97.2 neither here nor there it makes people think <laughs> it's, so it's just yeah it's just a placeholder for a high degree of probability nice well it certainly achieved its goal it certainly made us think about what it was <laughs> uh and so uh, we went through your blog and and on your website you mentioned that you identify as an absurdist and we were wondering what that exactly means can you elaborate on that yeah yeah sure it's it's a it's a worldview that drives everything uh, that I do in my personal life, general life, and definitely at work. So absurdism in you know, at least my flavor, my understanding of it, it, it refers to the inherent lack of meaning in, you know, in, in our lives. And uh, our lives are really shaped by extremely chaotic, seemingly random events. And you've got, but you've got the butterfly effect kicking in, you know, changing entire timelines for you. could have just been that one phone call that changed your life for, forever or that one book that you read. And these are things that you don't plan. So my life, my personal life has been heavily influenced by the teeniest, tiniest random events that I never thought twice about, you know, completely changed my life forever. But at some point I uh, started reflecting and realized that, you know, I never really had any specific goals, but even if I had any specific goals, they never have been 100% because my life has been completely you know, upended, uh, thankfully very in a very positive manner by these really small events. So once that clicked at some point, I know, maybe in my late teens, uh, it really changed how I think about everything. And one of the benefits I found of that way of that line of thinking when it comes to work is it helps you 
overcome FOMO and it lets you disregard status quo completely sometimes. And, you know, uh, you could be right, you could be wrong, but you get that ability. To cite a really simple, concrete example, at Zeroda, we are a stockbroker now. When we started building Kite, our trading platform, this was in 2014, all trading platforms in the industry were black. They had 20 by 20 grids of flashing numbers. And that's what Cruz used. <laughs> so I looked at it and I couldn't, I, I just couldn't grasp it. Uh, I, I figured, I thought myself that it's not possible for a human being to process 20 by 20 grid of flashing numbers, numbers that flash every second, uh, multiple times. And it just makes no sense whatsoever. So when we did the first design draft of Kite, there were just two numbers, you know. Uh, just a two column table, just uh, the name and the price, the name of an instrument stock and, and the price. And the whole platform was white. I think it was probably the first white trading <laughs> platform UI in India, uh, uh, probably elsewhere also. And everyone who looked at it said, what are you, what are you doing? Nobody's <laughs> going to use a white trading platform. Nobody's going to use a trading platform that doesn't show 95% of the numbers that others show. But, uh, you know that something like that could have been a, that could have been a big deterrent, and that could have really changed the timeline. But it just didn't make sense to me. And you know this whole absurdist worldview stuff is absurd. Trading platforms are black because you know someone back in the day made it black for historical legacy reasons, and it's just a status quo that continues. So uh, it didn't bother me at all, and we went ahead, and that really changed everything for us. So it's, you know, it's countless incidents like this in personal life and, uh, and in my work that has, you know, eventually turned me into a full blown absurdist from a newbie absurdist. So it's really about questioning everything, status quo, and just arriving at decisions objectively within, you know, it doesn't mean that you can go uh, bonkers and, you know, uh, be all nihilist about absolutely everything. You have to operate within a framework of reason and ethics, but it gives you that ability to see past a lot of buzz everywhere. So that that's really why I identify myself as an absurdist, and I kind of wear it on my sleeve, at least on my website, because you know that really that worldview is really the answer to a lot of questions, uh, generally about my work or you know what I do. It's super interesting. Like like, how do you, like, what are some of the cons, right? Because you mentioned a lot of the pros is it lets you see this, like, the world in a different view. But then when things don't have as much meaning or, like, you know, there's no sort of purpose or, you know, a lot of pre kind of labels that we put on things, right? Like, how, and it, also, like, the boundary idea that you talked about or that you can't go, like, too crazy, like, out of the, so, so it's very much, it's judgment-based, right? Like, w what are some cons? Like, why isn't everybody a, like, is being an absurdist, like, for everybody? Uh, I think, I don't know if it's scalable, <laughs> to, you know, to the broader humanity. Really, it's just, there are countless philosophies, right? I'm pretty sure everybody's an absurdist to a certain extent. Uh, sometimes you just have to let go of the status quo and, and take gut-based decisions. Of course, these decisions do go wrong. So the cons are that, you know, stuff goes wrong, but stuff can go wrong whenever. You can follow the status quo and, you know, it'll go wrong. So I don't think things going wrong is specific to this worldview. That just hinges on the probability of uh, success of a certain decision. If your decision, irrespective of how it was arrived at, does not really have a strong objective basis, there's a high likelihood that it might just fail. So the cons are really just the cons of any decision you take in life with work or whatever. So, and maybe on a slightly more philosophical level, it could be that if you tend to question everything and if you act out on that, you know that, you know, this whole thing is fake, but so I don't want to participate, you might end up, you know, cutting yourself out of uh, social life right, in right, general, right, you know, right. humanity. So even if you realize that certain things are just completely baseless and meaningless and people do it because people have always done it, you might still have to knowingly compromise and participate to participate in civilization really. So I, I would say these aren't exactly cons. These are just side effects of such a worldview. But you can deal with, you just have to be pragmatic. You have to be pragmatic about everything, uh, about this also. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, it reminds me of uh, 
the book by Yuval Noah Harari, Sapiens. I think he mentioned some of this and that. And uh, it's like, well, w- what is anything that we believe in? Call it money, religion, whatever. It's just made up beliefs we all tend to agree on, and hence civilization. Absolutely. If you if you did not believe in collective myths, there'd be no humanity or civilization or society. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well. Uh, so coming back a little back paddling, <laughs> uh, since you mentioned there have been an absurd number of events that have influenced your life uh, and looking back in a very positive way, if you had to pick two events that greatly influenced or changed the course of your life from that point on, uh, would you be able to share those with us? Yeah, sure. There are three distinct events that you know, that, that, that are always on, uh, that are always fresh in my head. After I'd finished high school and I started dabbling in programming after completely accidentally discovering the idea of code. This was, I think, maybe in 2000 or 2001. Uh, in fact, that was actually another event. Uh, I, I think I only knew two other people who had computers back then. And this was, you know, Southern India uh, 22 years ago. So it was a very different time. Very few, few, few people had computers and we had dial up internet, very few of us. And I, I, I can't recollect how it happened, but it must have been editing the INI file of some game to change the physics <laughs> or, you know, some sort of tweaking. That's when it clicked that, oh, you can change text in a place and it changes the behavior of software. That, that's really how it happened. Wait, wait, that's a, that, that's a euphemism for cheating, right? You were trying to cheat, <laughs> cheat the game. <laughs> yeah, it was, I think it was FIFA, FIFA 98. You changed gravity to, I don't know, 100 you kick the ball, it goes into outer space and never comes back. You know, some <laughs> fiddling around. <laughs> Something like that. But yeah, I was trying to cheat <laughs> on a locally installed demo game. There was no multiplayer. I see, I see, I see. It was not a, yeah, just a local uh, uh, install. So that that's, I think that's when it really clicked. Then I started saving web pages and editing text to change the behavior. And really, it really started off like that. So that one tiny realization of editing, I think, INI files, that really changed my life. So I became a programmer without really understanding what programming was or what it entailed or you know, where the future would lead me. But I became a hobbyist programmer. I started writing software as a hobby. So once I finished school, this was around 2005, I really wanted to continue what I was doing, which was sitting at home and working on hobby projects. But, you know, that's not really an acceptable situation in India. You can't just sit at home, not go to college, you know, there in immense amounts of societal pressure and whatnot. Things have slightly improved today, I guess. Shout out to all the so, Asian parents. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, I, I really wanted to continue what I was doing. I knew that if I uh, ended up doing a computer science degree in India, the curriculum would absolutely destroy me four years of I don't know what, and I definitely would not be able to program or work, continue working on my hobby projects. So I refrained from doing anything, and the clock was ticking. All my classmates, they'd all, you know, uh, started uh, joining different colleges here and there. And uh, someone, an old school friend of mine, who would move to the UK with his family uh, many years ago, he messaged me out of the blue on Yahoo Messenger, asking for some help with his computer homework. Because he remembered that back in school, I used to fiddle with computers. And I, I think I hadn't spoken to him for like five, six years at that point. And we were all really young, you know, 15, 16 years old. And I helped him out. And in the end, he, he, he asked me, you seem to be good with this stuff, you know, writing code. Uh, have you thought about studying in one of the universities in the UK? And up until that point, you know, the fact that it was possible for a student like me, you know, post high school, uh, to go, to go abroad and study that, that thought hadn't occurred whatsoever. Right? It just had it. But when he asked that on Yahoo Messenger, uh, and just that one line, it, that really changed the timeline for me. And that is when I, you know, started digging into it, uh, researched, spoke to universities and it worked out. So I think a few months later, I actually went to the UK to do a BSc in computer science. I got a partial scholarship. So I ended up in the UK. You know, that one line on Yahoo Messenger completely changed my life there. And could have worked out, could have not worked out, but it did change drastically. And the next big event was, uh, I was there for three years. 
did my computer science, you know, it went well, uh, the degree. And again, the, the next big life decision is to you know, find a job or figure out what to do or study more. I just wanted to sit again in my bedroom and work on my hobby projects. And it just seemed so wrong that I'd go all the way uh, to a whole different country, study in a university, get a degree and come back and live in my bedroom just doing my hobby projects and making a living doing freelancing. So that was a really difficult time, you know, <laughs> mentally to figure out what to do next. Again, somebody, a senior student from a different batch reached out to me saying, hey, I heard of you from this other student in that other batch. You seem to be good with you know, programming. I need some help with my coursework. You know, some completely random person who, who I'd never met. And I helped him. And after I'd finished my degree, or no, sorry, uh, after I was just about to finish my degree, he reached out again saying, this is my final year project here. I really, really need your help. There's this Java program. I really need your help. And I was like, sorry, I don't really do much Java. I can't really help you. And I politely uh, declined. But he was persistent. I think he, he, he messaged me every two weeks. And after like two or three months, he messaged me again. It was around 7 p.m. in the night. See, it's, so, it's like a flashbulb memory. <laughs> I remember it so distinctly, you know, something that changed my life. And he said, my final year uh, project is due. It's next week. If you don't help me, I'll fail. And this person, he's not my friend. He's just a person uh, that I've spoken to once or twice, you know, uh, in a whole different context. So I, for whatever reason, at around seven o'clock and it was really cold that night, I got on a bus and traveled an hour and a half to this person's place and sat on his personal desktop to help him out with this Java program. Just like that, you know, just... I, I went and, you know, and it was, uh, around midnight. So he said, you know what, my, uh, my roommate is coming back. You can't crash here. You have to go back. <laughs> wow. I was really, really pissed off because it was that around 1 a.m. in the night. <laughs> yeah. It was 1 a.m. in the night. It must have been minus 10 or minus 5 degrees. And, you know, the bus line had shut down that particular line. There was no way for me to get back home. And I was an hour and a half again. And I really thought, you know, all I could think of was unsavory words, <laughs> but, but thankfully, you know, I phoned a friend, he drove all the way there. He picked me up, you know, we went back home and I was really, really you know, pissed off. Then he messaged this person, he, you know, the student, he messaged me a week later saying, I passed, I barely passed my course, you know, coursework. Uh, it went through. Thanks for helping me with the Java code. You seem to, uh, oh yeah. And it was a simple neural network model. That was the program. And he was a, I think, MSc student, master's student. And he said to me, just this one line, this is my, my co-supervisor is Professor, uh, sorry, Dr. Christian Hike. Uh, he's looking for grad students to help him with AI projects. Why don't you speak to him? Just like that, casually, he dropped that one line along with this, you know, thank you note. And I sat on it for a week and I'd forgotten about it. A week later, I messaged Professor Christian Hike. You know, he was in the, uh, he was, he was an AI researcher at the university, still is at Middlesex, at the Middlesex University in London. I messaged him. Uh, he asked me to go meet him. I met him and he said, yes, I've got, I've got funding research grants for this particular project, you know, cell assemblies, neural networks, simulated neural networks. Uh, I need help with building some of these models. Uh, if you can program, why don't you help me out? And I was super happy. Uh, seemed like an interesting project. And I did that. So we wrote a paper and we, we published a paper. And that worked out really well. And that project became my final year project for my you know, BSc. My BSc, my degree ended right there. And I had to decide what to do next. And out of the blue, Professor... He's professor now. He was doctor back then. So Dr. Christian Hike said to me, why don't you do a PhD here? And up, up until that point, you know, those three letters hadn't even occurred to me. You know, I was, uh, I didn't even know it was possible to do a PhD without doing masters. Apparently it is in the UK. If the university is willing, if they like your work and whatnot, they can fast track you. They can let you skip masters entirely. So he said that and I thought about it and I said, I thought to myself that, of course, it's a really interesting area of work. The project was really interesting that I worked on. So I could just maybe just do that for three more years and I could continue working on my, you know, side projects. 
and you know i stayed on for three more years i ended up doing a phd <laughs> and see just that one line my completely ad hoc decision to get on a bus on a really cold night to go help this stranger that changed my life forever so then i ended up in the uk for six years and once i did my phd i had better clarity but i really still wanted to come back and you know work in my work work out of my bedroom working on my own projects i didn't want a job <laughs> but uh, b- because i had uh, obtained a phd at that point you know there were several really good offers to do postdoc research uh, at multiple universities there were industry offers because this was a phd in ai and you know even to an extent applied ai Uh, neuro computation this was 2010 so i i ruminated thought about it really hard for like i don't know 4 or 5 months and i decided to pack my bags and just come back to india just like that and i you know 6 years there had a great time studied a lot you know amazing programs and i just came back to i'm i'm from this really small state called kerala from india one of the smallest states so i came back to where i left from and with with the goal of sitting at home working on my hobby projects working on whatever i felt like working and of course you know uh, make trying to make a living doing freelance uh, programming and i'd figured that out you know i was making a, a decent dish living so i come back to this is now the third big event uh, i i come back to kerala and i realized the internet really really sucks it's still at 64 kbps and uh, as a student in london i enjoyed uh, you know fast broadband internet and i immediately regretted you know that one thing slow internet that really really you know uh, bumped me out bumped me out and it had only been a week after i'd come back to move back to india uh, after spending 6 years uh, away from india and my cousin to- said to me that bangalore has fast internet and you know i just left for bangalore i just packed my bags and you know got on a bus and i came to bangalore where i am right now this was 2000 uh, late 2011 or early 2012 and bangalore indeed did have broadband 16 8 mbps 16 mbps so uh, i found a place i rented a, an apartment here and it just moved to bangalore that whole pro- process took like um, a week 10 days and i ended up in bangalore because bangalore had you know fast internet and my cousin told me that you know bangalore had fast internet so i uh, i moved here you know set up my apartment i started working from home you know freelancing working on my projects experimenting and again yet another message from a school senior that i hadn't spoken to in like maybe 10 years uh, he messaged me on facebook and said hey i remember you from school you used to be you used to fiddle with computers <laughs> i have this i have this idea to build a financial app would you be interested and i asked him where are you he said i am in bangalore because anybody who wants to build an app ends up in bangalore eventually so and i said i'm also in bangalore let's catch up so i uh, caught up with my school senior uh, whom i hadn't spoken to in a decade uh, if not more and he had this he ended up in finance he was in mumbai the finance circuit and he quit the uh, finance industry because you know he was getting jaded and he had this idea to build a really simple investment app for the masses and this was 2012 and investing and trading was really complex here uh, you know there was bureaucracy there was a red tape uh, the fees were extremely high you know hefty fees and all of that and we started i liked the idea because i was always looking for projects to work on and we started working on it although i have zero background in finance or capital markets and he had this other friend who was also working with us and we go hang out in his apartment you know maybe 20 minutes away from where i was staying bangalore and it turned out to build a financial investment app in india you had to get regulatory approvals and you could only do that uh, by partnering with uh, a regulated stock broker so you couldn't just build software and you know take it to market it wouldn't work so we started looking for partnerships with large stock brokers nobody responded to the incumbents typical incumbent behavior but the second friend who's a, a, a friend of ours who at whose place we'd hang out uh, zerodas first office in a small little office on the first floor of the building happened to be uh, across the room 
and this was 2012 zerada only had i don't know maybe 2000 3000 users it was in an online broker nitin was experimenting with the low cost pricing model and we were looking for brokers and we'd just walk around on that street and one day we spotted that board that said you know zerada a name that we'd never heard of and it said nse bac mcx you know three three big indian stock exchanges and uh, abid uh, with whom i was working on this my friend and my school senior he walked in one day and said hi to nitin and you know, introduced himself saying we're building this investment app you look like a broker are you a broker <laughs> can we partner and it just worked out so then the three of us went spoke met nitin and spoke to him and he said we're a super tiny broker we have this disruptive pricing model but we'd be happy to partner with you try and get you the we'll try and get you the regulatory approvals this only happened because we were hanging at we were hanging around the same neighborhood and zerada's office happened to be across the road if it wasn't there we'd never heard of we sorry we'd have never heard of zerada and i I'd, i'd have never met nitin so we spent the next 9 months trying to build this app in the end you know a regulator shot it down saying no no we don't want any technology in this markets we like the way things are and we disbanded uh, gave up building on the app but nitin and i we started getting along well uh, on a on a personal level you know we liked each other like each other's philosophies i liked his way of looking at the business he liked my way of looking at technology and you know one day we said you know what that other project is over we all went a separate ways but why don't we uh why don't we work together and try to sorry try and build stuff here uh in in the stock brokers industry where nobody's really building any technology and in 2013 we started zero the technology and the last 8 9 years of my life has just been that you know that one blue board of that that we spotted across the road that happened to be in the same neighborhood completely changed my timeline yet again so these are the three big absurd events that i always <laughs> you know look back upon and this always gives gives me perspective when i'm when i'm confounded with some and a big life puzzle i just look back and i'm like oh yeah it was all random my life was random anyway <laughs> may as well you know uh, sorry sorry I, i know it was a little i went off on a tangent but oh no yeah, no no this is this is great uh th- there's no recipe on this podcast so this is great you, you say it's random but i feel like every time that happened it was like oh someone contacted you because you were very good with computers <laughs> and yeah. they liked you right which I feel like yeah you know the randomness is probably like a necessary condition but you know it's definitely not a sufficiency condition right where um no, I think randomness here is a big enough condition uh, my being a programmer and uh, my projects and what not they were of course they increased the odds significantly if I, if I wasn't a programmer no one would message me but just because I was a programmer does not mean that you know people would message and things would turn out this way so that randomness that you know that bit of serendipity is a significant two two digit percent component <laughs> in this you know holding up odds i like that i like yeah. that so you're like you're still making a lot of effort right because you want to push up your probability but you're also i feel like you're never disappointed because you know that the odds you know are not that great so absolutely yeah. you just summed it up so if there's no effort the probability is really low the better you are at something the more you more effort you put in your odds just go high absolutely nothing is guaranteed because you need luck chance randomness but if there's no effort there's nothing the odds are really 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 low right that should be uh you know the motto of our podcast it's like low expectations but we will we'll try <laughs> but, but please low expectations um, yeah also sounds like recipe for happiness over all exactly. thank uh okay so fast forwarding ahead you've been at zeroda as you mentioned for 8 years now and uh, you're the ceo at the company and zeroda is the largest stock broker in india at this point uh, to give our listeners some context uh, would you mind sharing some numbers around like the number of user base you have the volume of transactions or daily trades that you're doing these days yeah yeah so i think we are closing in on 9 million users here and by users i mean people who done full kyc people who paid a fee people who you know signed 50 pages digitally signed so uh, yeah actual users and uh, we hit a peak i think last week uh, where we processed i think 15 plus million stock market orders and these are actual transactions coming from end users you know sending them on 
uh, using their mobile apps and you know web apps, so not algorithmic transactions. So actually, fifteen million retail trades. I think that constitutes to about maybe fifteen or twenty percent of all stock market retail order volumes uh, in India across all stock exchanges, which is significant percentage of all uh, Indian stock market activity. And uh, there are a million plus people who are always connected, live streaming. They spend way too much time to get the numbers. <laughs> you know, to. And I think uh, last time I checked, we were streaming maybe 50, 60 million packets of stock market ticks every second to you know, so many users. And uh, at market opens or at when, when news breaks, we could we see tens of thousands of orders, actual uh, stock purchases and sales coming in at uh, like ten or fifteen or twenty thousand per second. You know, at, at that rate. So the volumes are really ha- high, and I would think that we are probably the most active retail stockbroker maybe in the world when you look at retail activity. Not not really the value of transactions because you know Indian rupee versus USD and you can't really compare, but the volume of transactions placed by actual end users interacting with stock markets, it's, yeah, we're probably the biggest, if not one of the biggest. Uh, I, I say that because last year when Charles Schwab in the US had uh, posted a press release saying we just hit a record high of end user transactions and we crossed two and a half million transactions. And at that point, we were at you know, seven or eight million. Uh. So, <laughs> So yeah, that's, those are some numbers. Oh, that's, I mean, that scale is incredible. And I think what's more is that Zero has, from my understanding, has never advertised, not spent anything on marketing. Like all this yeah. growth has been organic where users are actually paying a commission to sign up. Uh, they are yeah. signing up to actually do trades. And beyond that, I think, What's amazing is that you have a tech team, which you started as a solo engineer in 2013. And today it's still approximate, I think around 30 people, if that's correct. Uh, maybe yeah, 32, right. 33, something like that. Yeah, and yeah, 33 of us. So 33 of you, and you've built, as you mentioned, based on the numbers, at least like largest stock broker, if not the largest, one of the largest in the world in terms of volume of transactions. So for any engineer or anyone actually listening to this, it's mind blowing that, wow. So, and to be honest, the first time when I read your blog where you mentioned this, uh, so one of my friends texted me this blog saying, hey, you have to read this, this is awesome. Uh, and this this friend is in Bangalore and I went through the blog, I was like, holy cow, this is amazing. Like one, I really like how you wrote the blog and just understanding the philosophies of how the team operates. And we want to dig into some of that, uh, but Starting with like one thing which I want to begin with is, so you mentioned how you've scaled the platform uh, and we'll link all of your blogs in the show notes and I encourage all our listeners to actually go and read because entertainment aside, there are really good engineering lessons there. Uh, And one of the things you mentioned as your obvious secret sauce is self-hosting, which might not be that obvious if you ask many people. Uh, so I want to ask, like, can you share what aspects of the stack one you self-host so that we have the context to build upon? We we try to self-host everything that is practically possible. So our trading platforms, are the databases, you know, be it an RDBMS or be it uh, Redis or, uh, or ClickHouse, really large installations, we are... They're all self-hosted and self-managed, uh, and these are these are key components. But everything really about the business, our you know HR management system, employee portal, uh, support ticketing system, the CRM, you know all sorts of systems we've self-hosted them. So we we don't really use any SaaS CRMs or you know, support systems or uh, business tools or any of those things. Everything is self-hosted. If it can be self-hosted, where the trade-offs are worthwhile, it's not impossible to you know, uh, manage. We self-host it, and so far that has worked for ninety-seven point five percent of <laughs> everything. <that we> did. <laughs> so it has worked really well. Uh, you no, know, the, the one question that I constantly get asked is, "But who manages all of this? You know, how can you manage 
you know, hundreds and hundreds of systems. I think it's a myth that many of these systems need active management. The support ticketing system, we use POS ticket, you know, ancient piece of software. Thousand plus people log in every day, use it. We've been running it for six years. Every year we log in and once we were at, at, at a certain point where we've accumulated millions of tickets, we do some basic you know, database cleanup and archive and it just runs forever. Some of these tools, the you know, they're so rock solid, they will just run forever. And I think that fear that, oh, the system will need maintenance, oh, who will look after this? I think that that really holds back a lot of organizations and stacks. And if you're an absurdist, you really don't care about that status quo. Once you objectively understand that that this is good software and you can run it for a long time, you may as well just do it. So yeah, we abs self force absolutely everything, uh, technical backend systems, you know, components to business dashboards and systems that our non-technical employees use. Everything. Has there been any open source software where you've tried it for a while and then it just doesn't work super well and then maybe you compare a few options, but then in the end, there's just still that maintenance cost to it such that you have to switch. Like, has that ever happened? Uh, yes, it, it does keep happening, but uh, it hasn't really happened at a disastrous scale. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to think of an example here. Uh, ah, I can, I can, so we used to use PHP list. Uh, it's an old, you know, quite popular, it's a mailing list manager. Uh, we started running into huge performance bottlenecks, evaluated two, three, four newer systems. Everything was worse. We came back to PHP list and it just wouldn't work. In the end, it became unviable. And the cost of hosting millions of, uh, of your users on an external mailing list platform, let's say Ma MailChimp would have been uh, quite a bit. And we ran into this bottleneck three, four years ago. Now, if I may, I don't really know if this is the right way of looking at it, but throwing money at a problem is always uh, the last option that we consider in, in our tech team. That's our way of looking at things. We'll try to self-host or we'll try to maybe buy something. We've never really had to buy anything new. We'll try to roll our own. If none of these things work, we will like, oh, let's throw some money, money at it. So that's how I ended up build, uh, writing List Monk. It's a personal project of mine. It's a, uh, it's an open source newsletter, mailing list manager. So because none of these systems worked and because I really did not want to upload all our customer information onto some, you know, uh, SaaS system out there, I ended up writing this as a prototype, but it turned out to be a good project. Uh, it's scalable, it works, it's stable. We use it internally. Now, lots of people use it externally also. So that's one example I can cite where all we exhausted all possible open source options and we had to invent our own. So this is super interesting, right? Like the trade-off part that you mentioned. Uh, one conversation I can imagine in my head that some teams would have is we need a mailing list software. The previous option isn't working that well. Either we roll our own or we pay a vendor like MailChimp or uh, someone else. And people usually think about the dollar cost that they would have to pay versus, well, there is engineering cost on top of that. There is, well, for many people or many teams, opportunity cost that one, we need to find someone who will do this. And if that person does this, then what about all the other things that we need to get done? Uh, yeah. That's the trade-off people think about. So the amount of money in general is like... Uh, engineering costs as well as the opportunity part. How do you go about thinking uh, about these things in general? And uh, like, is it default that we'll self force because we've done the math or that math is something that you always look into every time you have to do this? We, we do consider all these trade-offs that you, that you just mentioned. Uh, these trade-offs go into every single you know, self-hosting decision. So as I said, just because we don't, we, we like to self host doesn't mean we are doing it uh, without an objective basis. If it doesn't make sense to self host or if it's impractical or if it's not, not good enough, we wouldn't do it. But like I said, so far, self hosting has just really worked out uh, for us in, you know, in all aspects. And the thing about money cost is that, yes, we could have just thrown some money at MailChimp and this was three, four years ago. But last year, we added six million customers, you know the whole 2020, you know, sorry, a year and a half ago, 
the whole explosion happened and nobody knew nobody in the industry predicted that the industry would grow manifold in a year so if we had computed costs based on our the current based on uh, the state of the industry at that point we would have been vastly wrong now this is just one mailing the mailing list manager is just one decision right there are hundreds if not thousands of such decisions and the dollar cost eventually does add up so it might not it might be immaterial for this one decision or the next decision or the next 10 decisions but over many years they all add up so one of the reasons uh, zerodha is a profitable you know we are a, a low cost but high margin high profit margin business and we've never had to raise funds is because of these early decisions you know uh, because of the frugality component that we incorporated into all our tech and product decisions so the amount of money today we save uh, because we self host is immense it is and it, it it's a huge component of the entire company's you know profit margin so it, it, these things definitely add up and and on on that note our if you look at our net infrastructure costs you know vms aws you know racks and different data centers etc it's it's peanuts if you look at it uh, as a percentage it's it's laughably low and that again throws out the misconception that to scale is a percentage of all your income has to go into infrastructure that's not really how software works you know software doesn't scale linearly so all of these decisions uh, as a framework they, they they make us what we are today and they always you know uh, pay off Or, or a long period of time, and like you mentioned, this is very contrarian, right? Because in Silicon Valley, the mentality is burn money, right, and then try to grow as fast yeah. as you can. And yeah. when you guys were maybe at the earlier days and thinking about, okay, you know, what does this look like in five years? Was not raising money always part of the plan, like from the beginning, or how did you guys deal with the temptation of, okay, let's go raise some, you know, VC money, and then we don't have to worry about these sort of things? Uh, thankfully, this is where our philosophies align. One of the reasons I, Nitin and I, Nitin is the founder and CEO of Zerodha. He founded Zerodha in 2010, 2012 is when we met. And uh, this is where we really hit it off. We are, uh, I absolutely uh, like his philosophy, his super pragmatic super practical grounded philosophies on how to run a business so we at zero we've never had any specific goals whatsoever we never said we need to get 100000 users or x revenue or a million users when we got 2 million users we never said right what do we do to get the next 2 million users we've never ever done that we've never had a projection we've never had any of we've never had any of those things our philosophy ha- has been really simple you know if we're doing technology we'll do technology the objective technology way when we offer financial services we will offer common sense financial services that make sense uh, for the user so we want these services to be really sensible to the user and of course we want to uh, make profits and be sustainable so you put all of this, this together we really took it slow and we grew very organically we were absolutely never in a rush to get to any arbitrary goal post 1 million users is a completely arbitrary number why not 800000 users or 5 million users or you know 100 million revenue or, you know these are all completely completely arbitrary projections right so called projections they're so baseless why should you let's say you are at 10 million in revenue this year why should you go to the grow to 13 million to to prove what to whom right generally to investors but we don't have any investors so this freedom of doing things with common sense being grounded doing things the right way doing things slowly and sensibly in no rush to become number one or big or large has really shaped how we built zerodha and how we've grown so this burn money you know fail fast it, it, we just don't get it we don't agree we don't get it and we've never followed that philosophy now i'm not implying that our philosophies work they they have just worked for us that's all they may work for others too maybe this is a horrible question but like 
It's hard to be contrarian, right? Because you look at all these other examples, um, especially successful ones, right? Where they are raising a ton of money and then they're giving crazy valuations and things seem to be working really well, right? And then you're looking around and then you don't have that many other companies doing what you guys are doing, right? How do you stay true to yourself? Yeah, this sounds really cliche, Ronak. Do you have a better, is there a better way to phrase this? Like, <laughs> Is it just not giving a crap about what else is going on outside? Or like, do you, do you have those like moments where you're like, oof, like, is this the right, you know? Um, I mean, at the end of the day, you're human. You, you do have feelings, right? right? So uh, once in a while, you, you think of these things. Is this right? Right, right. How how do you Uh, overcome those moments of weakness? (laughs) Is that, is that what they call it? Because if you're an absurdist, you really know that there is no right or wrong. So you use the word contrarian, but I have to be contrarian here and I <laughs> disagree. So you're contrarian, uh, your view is contrarian to another view if that view is, let's say, objective. Right, right. So, you know, burning lots of money, growing valuations, it's a trend. It's a you know, fairly recent trend. Businesses have existed since the dawn of civilization, this whole, you know, uh, burn fast, grow valuations is maybe 20, 30, whatever years old. So it's just a thing that people do. Yes, it seems to be, it is the status quo right now, but it's just status quo, right? Who said it is the way to do it? And what is really even the point of all of this? So you might feel a li- little left out if you're aiming for, let's say, a 10 billion valuation. But let's say your your company is valued at two or three billion. I mean, the fact that we use billions as a placeholder <laughs> today is really, you know, telling of times. But right. whatever, X. If you don't really care about these arbitrary numbers or valuations, then none of these things really matter. You don't feel left out because you're not really aiming for that in the first place. So we, the group of people at Zeroda, we, uh, we have a vision set very clearly. We like doing what we're doing and I, I enjoy that. I, I don't really get stock markets at all. I still don't understand it. I really like uh, working in the team that we built. You know, it's fun, engineering challenges, product challenges, and the and the business folks that we work with, uh, Nitin. It's all common sense and sensible. We make a good living. Uh, there's a sustainable, profitable company with like a 10-year cash reserve now with zero external funding. We don't have to prove anything to anyone. No investors to answer to. It's fun. It's like a hobby. So when you can make a really good living doing your own hobby and you don't have to worry about tomorrow or the next 10 years when it comes to you know financial sustenance, that's a really good place to be, right? So if you value that 4 billion, 5 billion, 10 billion, it really doesn't matter. You, you really only question yourself or feel left out if, you know, these arbitrary goalposts are your goalposts. But you don't, as I said, we've never had any goalposts. Going with the flow and enjoying it. I know it sounds cliche, but <laughs> <laughs> no, I I think that's incredible. Uh, not feeling that FOMO as much, or if and when you do, being able to kind of put it aside and go back to that. Well, the world is absurd. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. Um, exactly. Yeah. I think th- I would call that a superpower. Uh, for for many people, many people would want that. Uh, so in terms of going back to self-hosting a little, uh, you mentioned that you self-host and this is something that has worked very well for you. It has saved costs for the business as well. So the trade-off, the trade-off is well worth it. Yeah. But as someone is trying to self-host any software, and of course, software is not perfect. It breaks for reasons uh, out of our control. Machines go down and yeah. cables get cut underwater. <laughs> someone goes <laughs> dig, digs the street and hey, we lost connectivity. It has happened for any person who has been running software, but this yeah. is not something that's taught in school. Like in in school, you learn about a programming language, you learn how to write code, but you don't learn software engineering necessarily. You don't learn the operations part of it. And I heard you uh, you were saying in, in a different conversation where you mentioned that you hire a lot of folks from school who are just graduating. So yeah. how have you been able to build that operational muscle as a team for folks who have never practically run software at scale? We don't really have a framework and there are no formulas. It's just happened. Our team has happened to evolve a certain way. And I guess we had the luxury of time to do, to learn by trial and error. We were not 
burning cash or acquiring large number of users or you know uh, hinging on evaluations to prove anything to anyone right so i think that has played a key role so you can you know build things slowly you can make mistakes contain mistakes and learn from them so all the lessons that we've learned we've learned gradually over a period of 9 years it's only the la- over the last 3 4 years where you know our, our, our scale has just uh, increased exponentially until then the growth was really slow and linear and our growth as a stock broker is very closely tied to the performance of stock markets and stock markets were you know rather flat for many years you know throughout 2010s so it's it's just opportune if we were in a very different environment where you know there was stock market volatility every single day maybe things would have turned out to be different i don't really know but what has worked for us is doing things by trial and error and of course it's uh, one key thing one key aspect is that it's not just philosophies you need actual te- technical competence to self force and manage these systems uh, if you if somebody lacks technical competence or expertise they should not self force right i mean In, in a critical business environment so you need I mean, that that is that's a given you need to know what you're doing your decisions have to be technical and objective so thankfully we have those we had those in place i had as a uh as a hobbies programmer who would freelance for over a decade i had you know good enough experience in building and maintaining systems for others and you know exp- user expectations and what not so as as we hired and as the team grew we did the business was also growing slowly and organically so we really have the luxury of time to self host you know to break something and make it again learn a valuable lesson and so on and then when the markets when the industry the environment really just uh went through the roof we had already built like a solid technical framework uh, foundation in the organization and expertise so yeah i, I i'd say the luxury of time really was uh, an outcome of luck and the and the you know the early 2010s that we got to enjoy uh, early to mid 2010s yeah it's it's amazing you had the luxury of time to learn these lessons i think that's a, an engineer's dream to be honest like you take a system break it and see how it works and learn from that uh, yeah. now you mentioned that this is something that folks learn on the job and yeah. you still have to hire for competence So by the way I checked your careers website and there are zero job openings which is pretty unique to be honest uh and fascinating as well and one of my friends uh this was a few months back uh who lives in the US and he pinged me saying that hey uh, and we we talk about zero that and he's like hey zero that doesn't have any openings and I was like hmm that's pretty neat and that's still the case right now so how did you find these folks and how do you, how do you evaluate that technical competence uh to know that okay this person's going to be a good fit and they will know what they're doing and have the ability to learn on the job and and also the intellectual curiosity right cuz to be able to break these things down and then build it up again you you want people that are actually really interested in how things work right versus i'm very lazy yeah. you know it's like oh maybe <laughs> we should do something else here you know but yeah how how did you go about doing that uh it, it's really looking for these traits uh, as you just describe right you know there are certain traits curiosity uh, and i think hobby programming is a big indicator if you are a hobby software developer you write hobby software because you enjoy doing it when nobody is really watching you or judging you you're not doing it for your employer you're doing it in your free time because you like doing it and that that's a huge uh, indicator and i so we our hiring has been again very ad hoc uh, you know two people a year generally on average and i i i found all the engineers on you know uh, random forums or you know, local forums really uh, uh, bangalore centric job boards forums uh, when i say job board i don't mean like a big job site but a job board where people only post like 30 job openings a month because it's so niche and that's how Uh, that's how the connection was made to potential applicants and i've spoken to lots and lots of people you know countless people and 97.42% of the people don't <laughs> cut it just like uh, that i'm guessing that's true for every industry you know most applicants they just don't cut it and 
when you speak to someone, uh, you can kind of figure out their attitude towards work, their expectations from life in general. And, you know, that, that a very open, non-recruiter conversation uh, with no agenda, just to understand the person goes a long way. That works when you're only trying to hire one, two people a year, not if you're trying to hire, you know, hundreds of right, people right, a year. Right, so, right. yeah. So it, it's really been about conversations. And one of the things that I've done always is to set the expectations straight, you know, very clear. You know, we're not changing the world. We're not going to, you know, uh, empower the next billion Indian people with financial <laughs> <and> stuff. <laughs> you know, we'll... I, I tell people that most of the time you'll be doing really boring stuff, you know, processing CSVs for the industry. The regulatory risk is insane. You know, might go to jail for a mistake. <laughs> so uh, I think it's very important to set expectations very clearly. We've never sold a vision to anyone. And so people who get it despite all of this, despite the ground, groundedness of the whole thing, I think they, they tend to be of the right wavelength because they're not coming in to to be SDE level 6 tomorrow because there are no SDE levels at Zeroda. Everyone's a developer and that's that. And everybody has to do whatever has to be done. So these things are laid out straight uh, in, in these early conversations. And that's a great filter. People who can't really deal with that, they just, you know, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't follow through. And then... You know, give someone a really simple, super simple task. Uh, I, I, I tend to give a Python or a Go task and really simple, you know, make this HTTP call, fetch this zip file, extract the CSV, process it in a certain way. And we're looking at really beginner levels of beginner, uh, beginner levels of full stack software development. And from this really simple task, maybe, you know, 300 or 400 line task, you can tell a lot how someone structures classes, how someone writes their functions, how someone injects something, how someone invokes something, how someone writes the readme. These are all flags and you take all those flags in, you get a you know uh, certain intuition about the person. Yes, this person, he may not know a lot now, but this person, uh, he or she may, will pick up quite a bit or they will learn fast. And this has worked out really well for us. So I'd say two people have left the tech team for personal reasons, not really for you know, reasons relating to career. We've had to let go of I don't know, four or five people over the last nine years because they just, you know, didn't cut it. But for the rest, these things have worked. You know, we work really well as a team. There are, there's no politics. There's no reservations. Everybody's chill. Everybody's beaming everybody else and everybody has to do whatever has to be done. Now, nobody can say, I don't like CSVs, this is so boring. If you have to do process the CSV, you have to process the CSV. I do it, all of us do it. So it's set, it's about setting expectations clear. The the curiosity piece, I, I feel it's really important here. And from my experience where I've seen, maybe not the con, but if you take it to extreme, right, you have people that really pursue intellectual curiosity, right? Mm. And then they don't... Yeah, yeah. Right, it's kind of like when you ask them to do the CSV, it's like, let me come up with a neural network, you know, maybe 20 layers, uh, let's put a C in it on top of it. Um, yeah. How do you filter, like, I guess, so you just set expectations with them in terms of, but then do, do you ever get people that like, you know, come in, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, sure, they'll do it. But then, um, you know, how, how do you manage that? Um, it's like the right amount of curiosity, right? I think, uh, so even though we don't really have a code of conduct, uh, there are certain general philosophies, principles that the entire tech team, you know, works on. Unwritten rules that everybody knows. So one of those things is that you don't do impractical things. And how do you define something as impractical? If somebody is deeply curious about something, you know, you can go to great lengths to, to experiment with it, with no tangible benefits. But at the end of the day, we are a heavily regulated financial business. And our work carries a lot of risk and everything, you know, uh, is we are held accountable by multiple regulators. So that sort of work environment and the general principles with which we work, it kind of has created a culture where people don't really, you know, completely go off the tangent. Yes, all of us experiment, but 
we get together and discuss and debate objectively. If many people say that, no, this just does not seem, you know, worth it, then others ac accept. So the question really comes down to that, you know, about egos. If, if you're deeply convinced about this one thing and you really want to do it and the, and the others in your team are saying, don't do it, you might still go ahead and do it. Now that's ego politics. Thankfully, uh, you may or may not like the decision in the team, but you have to accept it. It's about mutual respect. So that those two things that we have to have mutual respect for the team's decisions and that we'll arrive at decisions by debating them objectively and as scientifically as possible. You know, we sometimes write down bullet points, pros, one, two, three, four, five, six, cons, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, pros outweigh cons. So let's do it or not do it. Even if you don't like it, even if your gut says otherwise, after enough deliberation, you have to go by the objective consensus. This works. This has worked really well for us. The, the, so the ego piece, like, would that be like a red flag during the interview if you feel like this person would have too much ego, like, um, coming in? Mm, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, one of those other things is, you know, technical skills, technical ability, sheer technical ability versus empathy for the team. Mm. Uh, I would. Generally, I've seen that, at least in the industry here, you know, companies that I interact with, people, people weigh sheer technical ability way more than, you know, empathy. So to have a team that works well, you need the right balance of technical skills and, uh, you know, empathy with the team. If there is someone who's supremely skilled, you know, like a hundred X programmer, uh, but if they can't work well with the rest of the team, that's, that's a no-go. I mean, that, 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 that doesn't work for us at all. I don't know if it, it may work for other teams. That doesn't work for us. Doesn't matter how technically skilled you are. You have to do whatever has to be done within this team and you have to work with everybody else. And, you know, people don't have the same skill levels, right? Uh, even within a three member team, the distribution of skill and talent will be very different. So this whole thing about, oh, he is a better programmer than uh, she is. or uh, So those have to be weeded out very early on. That's why we don't have uh, structures or levels or hierarchies or designations that imply that, yes, this person is a better programmer than this other person. Everybody implicitly knows that certain other people have their strengths, certain other people have their weaknesses. But with within the team, we have to all work together and do what what has to be done. So setting that very clear on day one, that uh, you have to continue ego and work well with others. That, yeah, that's absolutely paramount. That's how we hired and built the entire team. Yeah, no, the empathy, I think also totally agree is huge. And my first, personally, my favorite interview question is like a code review question where you present a code review to a candidate where then they give feedback to that uh, code review. So sometimes you would have candidates who are very talented on the code, picking like picking out all the mistake. But then the way they would give that feedback, right? Sometimes it becomes kind of clear where they just can't really put themselves into other people's shoes. But do you guys have any sort of specific methods to like to select for empathy? Because that's pretty soft or like pretty vague, right? Uh, it, it's very difficult. It's intuition. When you speak to someone, when you speak to someone about, you know, their life, their perspectives, their work, how they uh, write software, you know, about technical things, I think it kind of emerges. Of course, it's just a guess, but it is a largely informed guess. And as I said, that has so far worked out well for us, but it's impossible to quantify people's empathy into right, a score. Right, right, right. I mean, any sort of recruitment system that attempts to do that is flawed. You can't you know, turn humans into numbers. Yeah. Are there specific questions that have helped you get more signal on not just empathy, but some of these so-called soft skills uh, in terms of how the person would fit in the team, not enough ego, good empathy, things like that? No specific questions. These, uh, these conversations are never really interview questions. They're just free-flowing conversations, like the conversation that we're having right now. So pretty much all of these conversations have gone exactly like this. You start off with something, hey, that project that you did, that's nice. Tell me about it. And it might just branch off into entirely different things. So open, casual, free-flowing conversation. As I said, 
it's not really a scalable recruitment methodology <laughs> but if you're only trying to hire one or two people a year it's possible uh, but hey props to uh, Ranak for uh, you know looking out for our listeners who are interviewing for jobs trying to seek out some questions you know I uh, respect that thanks Ranak <laughs> I was rather trying to figure out as an interviewer how I could do a better job of getting that signal. But hey, works works both smooth, ways. Smooth, smooth. Uh, well, so there are a couple of things you mentioned, which I want to come back to. Uh, one of them was that you don't have these levels defined in the company like SD123. Many companies do that. Well, I should say most do that. So in your case, how do you go about providing feedback how do you go about like performance and growth included in that team because at the end of the year people are expecting to know what they're doing well and and money how yeah but the thing yeah. is also what they're being evaluated against like what's the expectation are they meeting that or not so how do you go about that with when you don't have these levels defined i think the word i'd like to use is holistic like a holistic approach but I, i understand the not so scientific connotations of that word but i can't really think of any other word so it's really there's no metric there's no system there's no matrix there are no measurements uh everyone in the team they have grown to own projects own responsibilities uh and you really evaluate them against the ownership they've taken somebody who's working on the trading platform it's not possible to objectively evaluate their technical work or product work uh with someone who's working on an internal system only for you know the business folks to look at how could you possibly compare right so it's not right so you evaluate people against the ownership and responsibility that they've taken up this person has taken up this responsibility how well have they done it and th- that's key that that's really the primary uh that's really the primary prospect of evaluation the the other one is yes this person this developer uh, has uh, taken up this responsibility to done it well but have they helped others or have they spawned of other projects have they helped other projects have they you know found time to spot issues in other systems and help them you know some people are really keen right they they like to be involved in lots of things they go help uh lots of projects lots of people some people are just content with just doing one thing which is also fair you can't have you need a mix of everything if people are not if everyone is content there's no innovation if nobody is content there's no stability so it it really depends on uh, that the ownership sense of ownership and the quality of work they've done in uh, in the projects they own the criticality of these projects uh, some of some projects are insanely insanely risky some projects are not risky and the kind of work you've done on risky projects and the kind of you've done work you've done on not so risky projects and what new have you done this year is it just the same thing as last year which is okay i mean like i said some systems just need maintenance forever but have you attempted anything new have to have you tried to learn something new and have you presented that to others saying hey i learned this new thing you know uh, maybe you can try this you know all of these signals put together gives you a pretty good uh picture of what everyone's doing thinking how people are working and because it's such a small team everybody knows what everybody else is working on everybody speaks one on one with everybody else so it it's uh, i have a good grasp of what everyone's doing in the team uh at any given point not because a micro manager monitor we don't do that either but because i am somehow involved in their projects you know via random connections so this tiny bit of this system also overlaps with that other system so i end up working with them and i get to know what they're working on so i guess this is only really possible in a really small tight knit flat team so this whole method of evaluation feedback uh etc is based on a deeply personal and hands-on understanding of each person and their work. Yeah, yeah only possible in a small team, I guess. So, it's, it's pretty unique, I would say, like everything else that we have talked about. As you mentioned that there are people who have started taking responsibilities for different systems, and what it sounds like is you have a team who can perform really well 
in a very autonomous way and people act like owners they take up responsibility and have initiatives and curiosity is something that you look for so in an environment like that how do you figure out who works on what uh, in a given time frame like okay we you got a plan for something either that's a fix that you're doing either that's a new feature you need to build how do you balance that part versus that there are few people who own that system whereas someone else who's just curious about that uh, so how do you balance works and what in that case i think that also is decided really on a case to case basis but there is some foundation there if somebody owns a critical project they are in the best position to uh, continue working on it now i'm treating just to a hypothetical example uh, our trading platform uh, it, it's an extremely critical front facing system right the amount of risk is immense and let's say there's a new feature that has been proposed but we have a long list of critical features that the principal developers are working on and this is other feature which can be done slowly and is not as critical now that is uh, right for being given out to someone who's interested in tackling it but if there's a critical change the principal developers have to do it 99 nights <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just objective you know you you it, it's a very objective decision the criticality the risk the necessity of a certain change of feature and there are some projects that come up in you know, a small little projects that are completely unrelated to anything They're like who wants to do this and if nobody is willing to do this i'll be like you know what you do this <laughs> so or i'll do it myself so it, it's that it's on it's it's a very it's on a case by case basis really and everything is every decision is uh, evaluated objectively it feels very human like instead of uh, systems and rules you know and uh, it's like having good judgment it uh it sounds nice i was going to ask like humans are non linear uh systems could be linear so when you have smart engineers in a room they have strong opinions some of them hold them loosely some of them not so much and people can have bad days with absurdities in the world so how do you go about resolving conflicts when uh when you see them and there is con- consensus is not being reached um uh, either in a timely fashion or in a way you would like uh i have very strong opinions many of us in the team have very strong opinions but as i said i think it really comes down to mutual respect even if i have a strong opinion and you know we hit a deadlock who makes that point 1% of extra sense it really goes to them it could be me it could be somebody else so it's never 50 50 it's always 49.99 and 50 point you know 01 so we have enough mutual respect to just lean towards that and and thankfully because of this we rarely have conflicts it's, it's, it's especially with technical matters right it's it's not i mean we could debate on a piece of art saying this is nice for such and such subjective reasons and we could be deadlocked forever but when you have when you're evaluating let's say a postgres database versus let's say a cockroach db you can write down the <laughs> you can you can evaluate them and you know pit them against each other scientifically point by point so when it comes to technical decisions and uh, most decisions in our environment are technical it there are rarely any conflicts there are debates you know space versus tabs you know <laughs> there are debates but you know uh, we lean towards that extra point 1% that makes slightly more sense when it comes to for the record yeah, it's please. spaces just wanted to set the <laughs> set the record straight but sorry sorry please <laughs> please continue <laughs> yeah i mean it was one of the biggest question marks in my life and i just gave up i don't care you know go fmt pep it whatever i i just i'll just pick one of those tools and stick with it and the, the rest of us will also stick i really don't care what space the tabs <laughs> anymore but i used to before i stopped caring for the record it was tabs no sheer beauty <laughs> you just can't i'm shaking my head uh, uh, after we are done recording i would love to watch some of this space versus tabs. <laughs> <laughs> sorry please continue but yeah so a pragmatic decision there space tabs don't work as long as there is consistency with everyone's work and we have some sort of central formatting tool that does it 
it's not a headache. So you know, we are over that. Uh, and that that's really how that's really how objective decisions are made. Now there are UI UX usability decisions that may not be so objective. There we again present our cases very subjective, saying that this is easier on the eyes or this looks better, and the debate could go on for hours, minutes, hours, even days. But in the end, there's always someone who's who has a point extra point zero one or point one percent. The rest are uh, rest respect that enough to be like ah yeah whatever so be it. So yeah, so there are no conflicts. There are debates. That's pretty neat. Uh, a very well oiled machine. Well, humans <laughs> is what I should say. Uh, now, many of these things, like you mentioned, when it comes to providing that feedback evaluating people and how well they are performing, being able to set certain principles uh, for the team and setting those expectations and the foundation for this is how we function, this is what you're expected to do. A lot of these things typically are things that managers do and considering that when you started at Zerodha, you said, like you said, you were a hobbyist programmer. So how have you grown as a manager, even though your role is, I mean, I've seen your GitHub comments and I don't know how you do it all. Uh, but there's a whole responsibility of doing things outside of technology part too. Like what factors have contributed to your growth in that area? Uh, so I, I was a lone hobbyist freelance developer before Zerola and that's what I wanted to be. And Zerola only really happened because, you know, the human element checked all the right boxes. I didn't want to have a job. I didn't want to uh, be in a corporate environment with hierarchies or structures. And with Nitin, I figured we could just build a team just being humans. And that's exactly what we've done in the tech team and outside the tech team, that you know, Nitin's team also. Uh, it's exactly that. So I, it just has, it's been... It's really based on, I know, common decency, you know? have mutual respect, sorry, have respect, be decent, be objective when it comes to technical decisions, be as unemotional as possible. And you just deal with people decently. I, I never, I'd never managed a team. Uh, I had no formal experience in managing a team whatsoever. So when we went from one engineer uh, in 2013 to two and three and four, it was very organic. When there were the two of us, you know, again, uh, behave with each other decently, do stuff technically, and that extended to three people. And today that has extended to 33 people. Now, the tech team is 33 people, uh, two designers, two mobile developers, and the rest of us are, you know, uh, developers and, and, and one person who helps liaise with other departments. But the rest of the company has grown quite a bit. There's, I think, 1,100 people uh, outside the tech team, compliance, legal, account, accounts, you know, stuff like that. So many of these philosophies that we've developed in the uh, in the tech team, and uh, you know, the core team that Nitin works works with, we try to extend that to the broader teams also. But it is so difficult. It's you know, in uh, in the other departments, there are hierarchies, there are levels, there are managers, you know, in the support department, there are managers. It is impossible. You can't, it, and a lot of that is really mundane work, right? Answering financial support calls is mundane work. How could, there's no creative spark there. So this whole thing about building a nice human team of people who like each other, work well with each other, who have mutual respect, etc., I think is not universally scalable that's that's a realization that i've had when when there is a, a shared goal of being creative or having fun or you know in, solving in intellectual challenges etc it's possible to find people with the right wavelength who can stick together and when you find the pe find people with the right wavelength it's possible for there's a high probability that all of them will can behave decently with each other so i, I mean I don't really like, I don't think I'm a people manager. I just know how to work well with my team that has evolved with these 
very specific philosophies in place. If you put me in a different environment and said, now manage this team, I might just fail miserably. I have no idea. So, but I mean, I have you know don't have that much experience, but I, I do definitely remember like the two different archetypes of a great manager versus a great like a technical leader, right? Because I do feel that well, the manage manager does make me feel like the team is well run. Like the leader, like the technical leader, is like the type that really makes me feel like I want to like be like them. And I feel like being in that position where, right, like being an IC as well, you're really, and also you're like kind of leading by example, like literally leading by example by doing like what's being done, right? So I think that's that's very powerful. But to your point, it doesn't scale. But I guess technology, we are in a lucky position where, like, if you're doing things right and you're investing all the time. Um, anyway, so those were all nice things. Rana, you should ask some hard questions to, uh, you know, balance that <laughs> off. Uh, I, I was going to do a hard pivot and ask a couple questions, which is uh, some things that some of our friends have uh, poked us to ask. It's like, hey, please make sure you ask this. And I'm like, we'll try. Uh, one of the things, so I wanted to read one aspect which was mentioned on your uh, blog. And this is something that Nathan also wrote, I think, in December uh 2021's blog where you mentioned that uh, brokering is going mainstream or something to that effect. Uh, you mentioned that it took Zerudo almost 10 years to get to 2 million customers. And around the time when COVID hit, uh, you added 6 million customers in a span of 18 months. And you had also mentioned in one of your blogs that you were doing around in January 2020, you were doing around 2 plus million trades. And in three months, you're hitting, what, uh, 6 plus or 7 plus million trades. Now, that's a step function growth or a hockey stick growth, however you want to call it. Uh, you've written in great detail about the way you build systems that allows you to scale with common sense. But when this happened in that span of time, especially as your team is also going through this change of like having to work from home and all the other systems allowed you to do that in a very well way, in a very good way, what parts of your stack had to evolve or change the most uh, to meet with the scale, even though the rest of the stack was working really well? Mm. Working remotely, not really a technical aspect, but um, from being a tight, tight-knit tight team who sat together, had fun together, worked together, uh, going, going full remote overnight, that was a bummer. That significantly affected how we communicate communicate. I mean, we, we kind of have the hang of it now, but I would still think some 50-60% of all the time we spend communicating with each other on on over calls and on chat is just really wasted overhead. Decisions could have could just be made on the spot and we would debate right there. It would be done in five minutes. But now it takes hours or even days to organize. And that element of spontaneity, which is critical to innovating and big breakthroughs, is I mean it's it's lost. Most of it is just lost. If you're not sitting together, you can't really have spontaneous conversation. So I feel that has definitely affected. That's a part of our human stack that has been significant significantly uh, impeded. Uh, the technology stack, thankfully, the slow, gradual, you know, first principles based work that we did over seven eight years put us in a position where when we went from 2 million users to, you know, uh, 8 million users, we didn't really have to do, there, there was nothing catastrophic that happened. Of course, we had to tune a few knobs, but we didn't have to change things overnight. We didn't have to, you know, do, we didn't have to do those things. Now, there's no formula. It's just, you know, that all the common sense decisions happen to pay off. So we scale well, but this, the biggest bottleneck in this industry is the legacy dependencies. Uh, you depend on multiple exchanges. You depend on lease line providers to connect you to those exchanges. Each new lease line has super limited capacity, like thousand messages a second. That's it. If you want another, if you want to send thousand more messages, you have to get another lease line. And each lease line takes three or four months. If you're adding more and more users, you need to increase capacity. I mean, you're just, there is absolutely nothing you can do, right? So this, kind of bit us but thankfully we were we've been you know working on setting up parallel infrastructure for lease line connectivity over like one two years anyway it took two years to get you know four lease lines connected at a new rack in a new dc 
but that kind of coincided with this explosion in 2020 March. And that was a highly experimental setup. This is the core order management system piece that connects all these platforms to the stock exchanges. And we flipped a switch on a Saturday, went live on this highly experimental, only beta tested setup and went live on, on a Monday with, you know, insane traffic. And we were all, you know, crossing all the fingers that we had. <laughs> but, you know, that, that was the, that was the closest we got to, you know, an implosion. But that worked out. So apart from this, uh, where you have to, it's really difficult to scale the physical constraints horizontally. Everything else was you know, manageable. We didn't, we didn't go on a hiring spree. We only two people joined us, our team after that, after the you know, whole 2020 uh, growth and they joined for different reasons. So I think that is an indicator that none of the systems really needed any sort of massive midnight oil burning or overhaul and we just continued what we were doing anyway oh, nice um since you mentioned one thing about the lazing lens it reminded me of uh so this question we we asked this question to every guest and i think this is like the right time feels like the right time to ask that uh can you share what's your favorite misadventure been and this could be during your time at zerudha before Tech related, non tech doesn't matter. No rules here. But what would you say is your favorite misadventure? I think that's a bit oxymoronic. I don't think <laughs> these misadventures, especially in this industry, can be your favorites. They are always horror stories, and you really don't want to think about them. And we've we've had many close calls. Uh, I don't know if this classifies as a mid misadventure. While all of this was happening in March, April, May, twenty twenty. Uh, our instant account openings, uh, you know, the whole process is online, finishes in five minutes. There are, there's maker, checker, KYZ, you know, really complex flow, which we'd optimized. So accounts that would get open in a few hours started piling up for like 15 days because, you know, the new users signing up, it just, uh, it just exploded. And it wasn't exactly a technical issue. It was a human process issue. You know, this industry wasn't really set up to handle so many online signups. So while we were grappling with all of that, you know, trying to figure out resources, new, better KYC processes, etc., the markets regulator and, and, you know, a scale, the number of orders were picking up like crazy every day. And we were monitoring systems, monitoring them 24 seven, just to be sure But they were scaling. All right. The stock markets regulator came out and said, starting uh, next month, I think the deadline was three weeks or whatever. How you sell stocks on a trading platform completely changes forever. So how it has worked over the last 30 years, you're going to change that in the next 30 days. So you log in, you click buy, it's bought. You know, 20 milliseconds is bought. You click sell, it's sold, 20 milliseconds. Now, each sell had to be authorized on an external payment gateway sort of a flow. A pop-up should open, user should go authorize, they'll get a, they'd get a message, uh, SMS, uh, validation message. They had to enter th that. They'd have to enter that OTP on the gateway. Authorize, come back to the trading platform and sell. And that is just ridiculous, right? That changes how everybody has sold stocks in India until that point forever. That completely changes the architecture of all the you know front-facing trading platforms, all the UX product flows, the entire backend. You can no longer send sell orders to the exchange directly. You have to integrate with this you know external thing. And if there are a million people trying to sell stuff at the same time, and you know, this gateway, which is hosted by an external depository, if they can't scale and send out a million SMS, suddenly the entire market is choked, right? So there were so many question marks and three weeks to build this and go live. And you know, we we wrote to the regulators, you know, sent deeply technical points, but that's the thing about Indian regulators. Once they decide, they decide. But that was quite insane. You know, I, uh, after our systems had become stable, maybe by around 2019, I'd stopped working 14, 15 hours a day and I cut it down to like 10 hours a day. Actively. <laughs> Slack. But this one piece, <laughs> so this one piece, you know, like 15, 16 hours a day, working on it every single day. And that was just me working on one piece. There were other people working on other pieces and everything had to come together on the 21st or you know, 30th day and we had to go live <laughs> on a morning. And that was a proper misadventure on so many levels. So many things broke, so many expectations failed. And we're talking about 
integrating with a legacy institution who's still using triple encryption, encrypt, put that encrypted payload in a JSON structure, convert that to B64, encrypt again, <laughs> they call it triple encryption, <laughs> with some cipher that was obsolete 22 years ago, which none of the popular libraries support. So you have to, you know, manually pad the ciphers by reverse engineering. And you have 21 days to change your entire business and trading platform and the backend systems and support systems and educate your users saying, starting tomorrow when you sell stocks, they won't be sold. You have to do this thing. Oh my God, that was that was a series of misadventures. And that is just one of the things about this industry here. The regulatory volatility and regulatory uncertainty is absolutely insane. All your grand future plans that you've built today to grow your business might just be killed 24 hours from now when the regulator comes out with a circular. That's how it happens. You get a PDF and it says change everything. So yeah, series of misadventures that I, I don't really know how we scrambled, but we scrambled and everything fell into place on the deadline day. In the morning, we, markets opened and nothing crashed in burn. People were, of course, annoyed. Like, I can't sell my stocks, but we had to slowly educate them over weeks and months. Oh, wow. Yeah. The most recent one. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly sounds very horrifying. Uh, very risky. It was. Oh, wow. Uh, thinking or since you mentioned regulation, I heard this news recently and actually someone even, uh, some of our friends mentioned this as well, that uh, India came up with the uh, financial budget and they mentioned crypto. And uh, I know, I think Nathan mentioned uh, on social media that when it's legal and the regulators allow it, Zerodha will be ready with it. How are you thinking about that from a tech perspective? Not thinking right now at all. So if, if, if it becomes regulated or legalized, firstly, I think that is that completely defies the point of decentralized. <laughs> if you know, if regulators say these are the three, four cryptocurrencies, we're going to list them on the regulator stock exchange, and you can le you can only trade there. That is just like any other future or options commodity. It has no crypto. It has no uh, distribution or decentralization. But if that ever happens, I'm guessing it's unlikely to happen. I think. But if that happens, it'll just get listed on the existing regulated stock exchanges, just like all other stocks, and they would, they should implicitly start showing up on trading platforms anyway. So, yeah, that that's that's my uh, assumption. I could be completely wrong. Yeah, and and the budget did not specifically mention crypto. Uh, I thought it was quite interesting how they framed it. They said digital goods, whether <laughs> it's whether they be backed by cryptographic methods or not transaction of uh, profits from transaction of digital goods uh, incur a 30 percent tax that's that's quite clever if you think about it yeah. now it's a little dubious what exactly is a digital, digital asset yeah. good. i mean if you yeah digital asset but yeah they, they very cleverly avoided cryptocurrencies i was going to add a dumb joke about how both of us don't know anything about crypto we're just asking it for seo but we can skip that we can skip that <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I only have a very surface level naive understanding of crypto. Yeah, so I don't really know anything about crypto either. Ah, uh, well, that makes me feel a little bit better about myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we're coming to a close, and Kalash, you have been extremely generous with your time. Um, we before we close, though, I, I have one question which I would like to sneak in, um, which is. Seeing how you have developed a tech team, seeing how you have been doing engineering, it's apparent that you have thought about a lot of things uh, and you think deeply about systems, people, how you want to work together. Have there been any people who have influenced your life the most or influenced you the most or your opinions? Or doesn't have to be people, a company, a resource, someone who has been an influence on you? I think I've picked up bits and pieces from many, many, many different people. So one of the things that I really like, uh, I like reading history, you know, completely random history, you know, like the memoirs of a certain person that, you know, we don't really come across. And I, I find it to be very revealing. These memoirs are also, of course, you know, biased also, but good accounts of history. And it really demystifies the lives of many people that, 
uh, we look upon. At the end of the day, everybody, I mean, everybody is a human being. They have the exact same human feelings, love, hate, jealousy, you know, uh, insecurity. So I think once it real, that this is one of those things that really led to me, my being an absurdist, you know, full blown. Because once you realize that it doesn't matter if it's a president or prime minister or astronaut or the biggest business person ever, they're just like us. You know, they're, they're super insecure, sad, jealous, you know, angry, irrational. So once you accept and realize that, it, it then clicks. So I picked up lots of things from many different people. But there's this one book that I think completely flipped me over into my you know, absurdist worldview. It was Phantoms in the Brain. Beautiful book. I've read it like three, four times over the years. I think I first read it in 2008. Uh, and uh, my professor gave it to me saying, you might like this. It's about brains, intelligence, you know, consciousness. You know, we were neurocomputation. That's what, that was our research area. And uh, B.S. Ramachandran's uh, book, uh, he's a neurosurgeon. And that, that was really the, uh, tipping point for me that, you know, everything is just in here and all the, our entire worldview is just a figment of our imagination. So all the reservations that we hold, all the deep convictions and crazy strong uh, ideologies that we hold, it's all here. I could just, uh, once this podcast ends, I could be getting up, I could, you know, tip over, bang my head and I'd be a completely different person. It's just, just that simple, right? Or uh, the president, uh, the most powerful person could just, you know, slip in their bathroom and, you know, be bedridden, changing the course of history forever. So if you read history, you will see that many humongous, you know, historical events that have shaped the world have just been really random coincidences. So this book just really drove the fickleness of our own minds and our own preconceptions right into me. And it sounds... It sounds cliche and a little hand wavy, but you know, that sense of being somebody, the sense of the somebodyness in me, it just vanished. I like shit. I'm a, <laughs> part of my life. I, I'm a, I'm a nobody. And when I, I snap back to it saying, Oh, I'm a program. I do these things. I have my responsibilities, but I snap back again saying at the end of the day, I'm a nobody. I'm here today. I'm not here tomorrow. And anything could happen to me at any moment. You know, I could just have an aneurysm and, all my life goals will be wiped out. So what is even the point of having la- long-term life goals? Just you know, uh, do decent things, be decent. That's really the absurdist worldview. No, no, no long-term goals or you know, really strong ambitions. Just do decent things. So that one book was really the tipping point. And after that, I've read many similar books, just uh, reinforcing the idea that, yeah, it's all just... Thanks for sharing that. We'll certainly link it in the show notes for our listeners to check out. And I think that's a great place to close. And Kalash, once again, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been awesome. Uh, we've learned so much just in this conversation and I'm sure so will our listeners. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for listening to the show. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and learn more about us at softwaremisadventures.com. You can also write to us at hello at softwaremisadventures.com. We would love to hear from you. Until next time, take care.